Today I'm going to present a little, a short story as a matter of fact. This, is, this all started uh, quite a while ago. Uh, <coughs> my first trip to Africa was back in 1977 when I was a graduate student. I got an opportunity to go to Africa for one year to, I was interested in studying uh, size scaling at the time, the difference between different sized, how size changes the physiology, the size of the animal. Um, and when I was there doing the experiments, I happened to notice that uh, the wives of many of the people that I, that I was working with were walking around carrying loads on their heads. Not just carrying loads on their heads, carrying huge loads on their, on their heads. <laughs> And that started my interest in, in this particular study. So even though I wasn't originally there to look at this, we collected some data at that time. And that started this series of studies. I uh, ended up with uh, taking three trips to Africa total for about a year each in order to collect all of the, the data that we present here. <coughs> Okay. Uh, when you when you're walking around, you're traveling in East Africa. I was in Kenya at the time. Uh, in in the rural part of the country, it's surprising how often you see women carrying things on their heads. Never men. It's interesting. Men never carry things on their heads. In fact, men rarely carry things. Uh, the, uh, the, but you see, right from the very beginning, little girls, if, a, if somebody, some mother wants a loaf of bread or a bar of soap or something small like that from the local store, she'd send the, the little girl off and the girl would go buy it and she'd come back and it would be on her hand. And she'd have her hands free, she could do whatever she wanted, she could carry it in her hands, it was just a bar of soap. But she wouldn't, she would put it on her head. And uh, so these, these women carried loads, head supported loads, uh, from the time they were very young, right out throughout life. Let's go. Okay. <laughs> I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, is why I'm waiting. I'll wait for the slides to catch up to my talk. Okay, so no works are ever done in isolation. Uh, so I uh, acknowledge my co-workers right off the bat. Uh, these are the people that were involved in these studies. This is actually a report. Uh, these results have been reported in four papers <coughs> with these co-authors. Uh, strangely enough, only this person, who was my advisor when I was a graduate student, uh, it's the only person who's ever at uh, was the only person who ever was participated in, in the experiments in Africa. The others never never were in Africa. Okay, so this is a typical scene that you could very often see in East Africa, in Kenya in particular. Now, women carrying things on their heads, quite sizable ones. And this, is, this observation is what piqued my interest in women carrying loads supported by their hands. Uh, in the region that I was in, just, uh, just north of Nairobi, the countryside outside of Nairobi, there are two groups of women predominantly available there. Uh, one was the Lua women, and these women carried the, heads, the loads directly on top of their heads, so the loads were on top. And the other group, or the sort of the dominant group of the region, the Kikuyu women, and they had a strap that came across, they're sort of at the hairline here, right where the hair is, right there, and the, the loads were behind them, as you can see in this diagram. And uh, the incredible thing is that these, the Kikuyu women carried loads with a strap so often that if you ran your, your hand up on their skull, their skull had a permanent indentation in it from the, from the, 
adaptation to the continual loads on the, on the strap. It's uh, really astonishing. So you see these women carry these really large loads. Uh, and, and the first question that came to my mind was, is this a, an economical way to carry loads? Why do they carry loads like that? We always carry loads in the backpack or a wheelbarrow or something, but never supported by our heads. So the question was, is this a particularly economical way to carry loads? That happened to work very well with the other experiments I was doing at the time because I had the equipment to answer this particular question there. Uh, so we trained some women to carry loads while walking on a treadmill. Uh, this woman, for example, was quite a small person. She was only about this big. Uh, my wife got to, uh, well, she wasn't my wife at the time. She was my girlfriend at the time, but she got to know her quite well. And, uh, and this woman was very proud. Uh, she had had seven children, and she was very proud of the fact that she had five that were still alive. Something that sort of struck my heart at the time. Anyways, this bag is filled full of sand and weighs two-thirds of her body weight. And she's sitting there uh, smiling at us. <laughs> if I were to do this, it would break my neck, as I'll explain later. Uh, so we trained women to walk on the treadmill. Here's a, a, treadmill, a treadmill. And we measured their oxygen consumption. We were interested in determining the energy cost of carrying loads. Oh, pardon me. Uh, and so we measured their oxygen consumption. We did this by what's called the open flow method. And that's where the, the subject wears a loose fitting mask and the air is brought down through the mask. It goes uh, through a flow meter. That's what this thing is. And in the other room, there's a little hole there in the wall. In the other room, there's, in fact, a vacuum cleaner, uh, mask bacteria. So we can have a relatively high flow rate. And this system is, is a very good system for measuring oxygen consumption because it's uh, independent of leaks. You don't care if there's a leak in the system. As long as the system is l l somewhat less, it's at a negative pressure relative to the outside pressure. So if there's a leak, it's a leak, leak into our flow. And the only place where you can't have a leak is between where you measure a small aliquot of this air and the flow meter. In that one section of tube, there's no leak allowed. But if you measure the oxygen concentration in the air and the flow rate at the same time, you could care less about leaks. So this really works quite well. Um, uh, the decrease in oxygen concentration times the total flow rate is equal to the oxygen consumed by the subject. So it's quite simple, quite accurate. Uh, we made the assumption that one liter of oxygen is equal to 20.1 kilojoules of energy. This is quite a good assumption. It's a worst case error of about 5%, which doesn't change our results as we see. Okay. So here's the results. This is the oxygen consumption rate as a function of the walking speed. This is walking only. And this is the curve for the unloaded women. So this is women just walking without a load on a treadmill at a constant speed. Uh, this is measured at one load. We chose a load of 34 kilos. And uh, the Kikuyu and Lua women are both superimposed. The, 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 uh, here. the triangles of the Lua, the circles are the Kikuyu. And this shows a, a classic result. This is well known uh, before the study was done, that the cost of walking, the energetic cost of walking, uh, is curvilinear, and there's a minimum at some optimal speed. The optimal speed is about 3.25 kilometers an hour for these women right here. Okay? This curve is the same women carrying the same, no, the same women carrying the load. So this curve is unloaded. This is the same women, same time, carrying a load of 34 kilos on their head. And you can see that the curve is shifted upwards. And again, there is an optimal speed uh, where the, the cost is minimum. And the, the optimal speed didn't change. It remained at about 3.25 kilometers an hour. Um, 
for reference, the only study at the time that was available, the only good study at the time that was available uh, looking at carrying loads was a, a massive study done by the U.S. Army of uh, Army recruits carrying backpacks. And it was quite huge and all the data got re re reduced to equations. So the equations, we can plot the results of, of just the equations. And this would be the cost of unloaded Army recruits carrying a backpack, no, unloaded, unloaded. And this is the Army recruits carrying a backpack at the same speed. And uh, you can see that all except for at the very lowest speeds, the uh, African women were more economical than the Army recruits. Down here, the second graph shows the stride <coughs> frequency, or the step frequency actually, as a function of speed. And uh, the only point, uh, I'll exp th this will become important later when I start talking about the biomechanics. The only point to notice right now is that there is no change with load. That loaded or unloaded, the step frequency is re remains the same at a given speed. Okay. <coughs> so this is a, another graph showing the, summarizing the results. Uh, and I'm going to show many graphs of this type, so it's, it's good to understand what we have here. The abscissa is the total weight divided by the body weight. MB is the, the body weight, the mass, the mass of the body. So this is the increase in weight. 1 means unloaded. 1.2 is a 20% load, 40% load, 60% load, or 80% load. And, and this is often plotted. You'll see I'll have lots of graphs like this, where it's a uh, something, in this case oxygen consumption loaded, divided by oxygen consumption unloaded. So this is the increase in oxygen consumption compared to the unloaded state. Again, so this is, this would be unloaded, 20% increase, 40, 60, 80% increase. Okay. And what we see here is for the this is the African women, uh, and what we see is that they can carry up to 20% of their body weight for no increase in metabolism. And this is, if this is really the case, I would, there were situations where I would have the woman walking on a treadmill, uh, carrying the load on her head, and we'd be measuring her oxygen consumption, and I'd get up on the treadmill behind her, and I'd pick the load off of her head, and she would continue walking without changing her stride or doing anything, and the oxygen consumption line was just dead and constantly couldn't see anything. And then we would change the speed a little bit, and you would see a step up. So the, the system was working, but it, really, there is no way to distinguish between loaded and unloaded for loads smaller than 20% of their body weight. That's 20% of your body weight. Not nothing. Uh, this is like a, a good-sized valise uh, to carry, to you're carrying around. It's a, quite, quite a considerable load. The dotted line, again, is the uh, predicted line for Army recruits. You can see that Army recruits uh, are considerably more expensive, particularly at high loads here, the difference is uh, up to 60% different. The African women can carry large loads 60% cheaper than a highly trained soldier. So this was the, the, the first study, this was the results of the, uh, my first visit in Africa, my first time ever in Africa actually, and uh, kind of intriguing. <coughs> Especially the 20% for free was uh, pretty amazing and, and, the, and the much cheaper than carrying in backpacks. So naturally we wanted to know why this was the case. And so this gets us into the biomechanics. We're looking for a mechanical reason to explain these results. Uh, <coughs> and so I managed to get a, a, a a grant for a second trip to go to Kenya to measure the women, and this time I brought some equipment uh, called a force platform uh, to make some measurements. Now a force platform is a, a section of floor, <coughs> previous talk had a picture of one in the corner, <laughs> uh, it's a section of floor that can measure the forces exerted on it when you walk on it, and it measures the forces in the vertical, lateral, and four-aft direction. And it's, and it's 
usually long enough so that you can get in oh, a couple of steps. And the way it works uh, is if you're touching nothing except the force platform, then you're exerting no other forces on anything. The only forces that are being exerted on you are the forces of the force platform. And in that case, you can do a classic free body analysis. And you can make measurements of the movement of the center of mass of the body or the body plus the load. The center of mass of whatever's on the force platform, in fact, with great precision. And so we measure the movement of the center of mass of either the subject by herself or, or the subject plus the load, the combined center of mass. Uh, quite accurately. <coughs> but before I can uh, actually talk about that, I have to explain a little bit about pendulums. Everybody thinks they know how a pendulum works, and so I'm going to explain it to you anyways. <laughs> uh, here's here's a, a pendulum. Just happened to have with me. And uh, it swings back and forth. And what's actually happening here is it goes up to one position and it momentarily stops when it reverses direction here. And that moment, just that moment when it stops, the kinetic energy of the pendulum goes to zero. And then it goes, and it stops here and the kinetic energy goes to zero. When it swings down, at this point, the pendulum, the mass, is at its lowest point. So the potential energy is at minimum, but the kinetic energy is at a maximum. So at the, the point when the string is vertical, the potential energy is minimum, kinetic energy maximum. It swings up here, kinetic energy is zero, potential energy maximum. It's at its highest point. And it swings back and forth like that. Okay? So that's basically what a pendulum is doing. It's just taking kinetic energy, which is large here, and turning it into potential energy which is large here, and vice versa. Okay? Simple. In a perfect pendulum, 100% of the energy would be transferred back and forth, and the, and the pendulum would continue to swing without any input to energy. We would just continue to swing a, a perpetual motion machine. When you walk, we're actually walk as an inverted pendulum. And uh, this is showing actual data taken from the subject uh, on a force platform. Sorry. And, uh, and then I'll explain. When you're, you're walking along, when I'm at this point in a walking step, my center of mass, which is somewhere around here, uh, is at its lowest point. But it's going fastest. My forward speed is the highest. And I take some of my force forward speed and I use that to ride up onto my leg. Okay, so my center of mass goes up. But during a step, this is the point when I have the slowest speed. I'm moving the slowest now. And then I take this potential energy when I'm up and I fall forward and I take this potential energy and I turn it back into kinetic energy at this point and I'm at the next beginning of the next step. When I'm moving fast but I'm low, then I go high, slow, fast, low, I'm exaggerating now. <laughs> high, slow, etc. And you are an inverted pendulum converting kinetic energy into potential energy back into kinetic energy. So this is the fundamental property of the mechanics of walking. Uh, this was actually discovered by one of my co-authors, the first co-author in the list in the beginning, a professor of environment at the uh, University of Milano. Uh, and in, in an unloaded adult, you, you or me, or these African women, we can exchange about 60% of our energy back and forth, which means about 40% of the energy changes in the kinetic and potential energy have to be resupplied each step or else we'd stop. We'd be like a pendulum that slowed down. But if we want to continue to walk at a, at a constant forward speed, we have to with our muscles, resupply the 40% that's lost each step. Okay? So that's a qualitative explanation. Here's the quantitative explanation. Uh, these curves are too dark. 
Anyways, this is the African women up top and the control subjects down below. The left column is unloaded subjects and the right column is loaded subjects. This curve is the uh, kinetic energy of the center of mass. This curve is the potential energy of the center of mass. And you can see they're nicely out of phase. Okay? So when there's a decrease in the kinetic energy here, that can be transferred into an increase in the potential energy here, and vice versa. When the potential energy goes down, this, so this is when the person's up high, potential energy is massive, he's mid stance, but he's moving slowly, so the kinetic <coughs> energy is minimum. Now he's going to fall forward. He's going to take that potential energy and turn it into kinetic energy. He takes the potential energy here and turns it into kinetic energy there. If I sum these two curves, I get the total energy of my center of mass. And you can see there are some small oscillations in this curve, even though the oscillations in the total curve are certainly smaller than the oscillations in either the kinetic or the potential energy curves. All right? So when there's a decrease in energy of our total here, this increase has to be supplied by the muscles. This is energy lost. This is work that has to be done. Energy lost, work that has to be done in order to keep walking. And you can see that if you compare our unloaded African women with our unloaded control subjects, they're really quite similar. The, they're out of phase to two curves. And the amplitude of the changes in our total curve are quite similar between the African women and unloaded and us, control subjects, unloaded. If you look at them carrying a load, you can see that the changes in potential energy are bigger here than here. And the changes in kinetic energy are, this, the vertical change here is bigger than here. So the load increases the energy change, as you would expect. Uh, but in the African women, you can see that the total here isn't very different from the total unloaded. The increments in this curve, there and there, are not that different from the increment in this curve, there and there, of the other one. These increments are what, that's the work that muscles have to do to keep the system going. That's the work of walking. Okay? On the other hand, if you look at the control subjects, again, these curves are larger than the unloaded, but the total curve shows bigger increments necessary to keep the system going than the unloaded case. So this is really quite interesting. Uh, here's a summary of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the results of many experiments. The, the, these, this is just one step under these conditions. We did this many times, of course. And this shows the, uh, the summary of that. This is the recovery of energy. This is the percent of energy that's transferred back and forth between kinetic and potential. So one minus the recovery is the work that has to be done. Okay, so the more the recovery, the less work you have to do. And you can see this is as a, a function of load, as we've seen before. The system often is going to be the increase in load. So the energy recovery for an unloaded uh, control subject or African woman, no, no, the other way around, is, is, uh, is about the same. We can, in this case, we have 65% recovery for both the African women and the control subjects. So an unloaded African woman walks like we walk. There's no difference. But as you increase the load, the African women increase this recovery. While in a control subject, you increase the load, it stays the same and maybe increases a little bit at the end. But clearly, the women increase the energy transfer between the kinetic potential when they are loaded, when they increase the load. They become better pendulums. While the control subjects are unable to become better pendulums. In order to explain this, we have to get into a little bit more biomechanics. 
And so I'm going to introduce here the uh, external work. This is the external work, again, as a function of the increasing load. External work is the sum of the increments in the curve here, the total curve. Whenever it goes up, that's work that has to be done by the muscles. Whenever it goes down, this work is lost. So if you sum up all of the increases, that is the external work. It's called external work. Uh, and you can see that unloaded, the African women and the control subjects do the same amount of external work. They walk just like we do. But when you increase the load, the external work uh, actually decreases in the African women. Now this is external work divided by the mass. We would call the mass specific external work. So it's a work divided by the mass. This is so we can compare big subjects to little subjects, but it also so we can compare big loads to little loads. All right? So this is total work done divided by, the work goes up with the load, but then we divide it by the total mass. Excuse me. Yes. Is the difference uh, statistically significant? Between this curve and this curve? No, between uh, this, these No, these. no, below. In the, between this point at 1.2 and 1. Oh, there and there. Yeah. Um, you said there is a decrease, but uh, I think there is no difference. Well, okay. <laughs> the same for the upper curve. Yeah, but no, there's, the, uh, there's a statistical difference between the two curves, and in terms of whether this point is actually different than this point or this point or this point, I don't know the answer to that. These, these lines are the 95% confidence limits. So uh, I think it's quite clear there's a difference between the, the control subjects and the African women. Um, but you're right in the, in the sense that, I don't know, I would say that the general trend seems to be, would be down, not up here. It's a trend. It's a trend. Yes. OK. Other questions? Yes. Precision. Uh, the control group they had a load on their head or on the backpack. The uh, controls in, in these subjects were the backpacks. We actually tried experiments. Um, we were wondering if an untrained person carrying a load on their head would see the same benefits as an African woman. Woman. So we used ourselves as subjects. We had. We took a, uh, a bicycle helmet, you know, a, a crash helmet for bicycle, and we put a bunch of lead weights on it, and we could get up to about 15% uh, of our body weight with a lead-weighted uh, helmet before, really, you, you didn't want to walk with that because you, you really felt that if you lost equilibrium a, little, equilibrium a little bit, your head would just fall. You couldn't control it. So we, we walked on a treadmill with up to 15% weights on our, on our heads very carefully, you know, thinking we're going to break our neck at any moment. Uh, but we could get nowhere near the weights that these women were carrying. 15% uh, was the maximum. So we never really got a good, clear answer to the, to the question, can anybody with a load on their head act like an African woman? Well, they can't in practice because they can't carry the loads. <laughs> okay. So this, here we have another graph uh, of, this is increase in load, and this is increase in energy now, uh, the usually expressed energy loaded versus energy unloaded. And there's several different energies here, so I, I mean, I'll explain. Um, this is the ratio of the work loaded to unloaded as load is increased in the African women. And this is the, the same thing in uh, the control subjects. So this, this is now what we call total work. Before I was talking about external work, which is the movement of the center of mass of the body. Uh, th the complement to that is the movement of the segments relative to the center of the mass. So I have my arms and my legs moving relative to the center of mass. That adds up to the internal work. And we made the assumption in the beginning, remember I said the stride frequency did not change when you added a load to this subject, one of the first graphs. 
So based on the fact that the stride frequency didn't change, we made the assumption that the internal work didn't change. So the movement of the arms relative to the center of mass during walking was the same with and without a load. Given that assumption, we could calculate the total work. And this is a graph of the total work. <coughs> and you can see that for the loads up to about 20%, it doesn't appear that there's any increase in the total work. Um, for the, for the African women. This is because for loads between 0 and 20%, they become a better pendulum during that period. So the work, the mechanical work goes up, but the, I don't want to say efficiency because that's got another meaning, but the, but the uh, efficacy of the pendulum goes up as well. And the total is that the total work remains the same for up to 20%. And after that, the work tends to go up <coughs> in the African women. You can see in the control subjects, the work goes up immediately. As soon as you have a 10% load, the work, in fact, has gone up 10%. 20% load, the work has gone up 20%. This is the increase in load. Okay. Uh, the increase in work as a function of increase in load. Uh, this line here is the original oxygen consumption line that we saw for the African women. So this is the energy expressed in, in this is metabolic energy. So this is the work done. This is the energy input to do the work. Uh, this is the after the recruits. And this is a proportionality line. Okay. So it's, this, we think, is, is a, a kind of a nice story because it really shows an explanation for the first 20%, why they get 20% for free. Certainly, you carry a 20% load, which is not zero. It's a, it's a considerable load. And certainly, the work goes up. But in compensation, you become a better pendulum. So the total work, in fact, remains the same for the first 20% of load. And then as you increase the load beyond that, something else happens. The, the work starts to go up uh, independent of your percent recovery in, in your walk. So the question then becomes, everybody always asks, how do they do it? You know, what are they doing differently? So they become a better pendulum. But can you explain that? What does it mean to become a better pendulum? <coughs> well, that uh, gets into a little bit more scary curves. But uh, this, this is really quite simple. This is uh, percent recovery. So this is the energy that's transferred, in fact. Recovery is the energy that's transferred between kinetic and potential or the other way around. Uh, as a function of time, during the course of one step. So the recovery up till now, I've talked about, we can, we can transfer up to 60, 65% of the energy back and forth. We can recover 60, 65% of the energy. <coughs> that's over a steady state basis. Now we're going to look at when this recovery occurs during the step. So here you have the kinetic energy curve, as we've seen before. This is the forward speed curve, effectively. Here's the potential energy curve during a step. And this is the total energy curve during a step. This is what we've already seen. Okay? This is the pendulum mechanism. And we can see, uh, for example, when the potential energy is flat, or when the kinetic energy is flat, there can't be any transfer. You can only have a transfer when one energy is going up and the other energy is going down, or the other way around. But if one energy is flat, there's no transfer going on. Okay? So these little vertical lines here, in fact, denote when there can be no transfer because one of the other curves is flat. And you can see during a walking step, when the person is going from low your potential energy is low, but they're fast. Going from there to here, so they're going from low to high, low to high, or fast to slow, you can see that there's a nice transfer of energy. The transfer is up around, oh, something like 80%. And then when you're at the very top, just for a moment, when you're right at the top, there's no transfer back and forth. The transfer goes to zero. 
And then when you fall forward, again, the, the transfer goes up and it's not quite as nice during the fall forward stage. You don't have a nice flat top here where a lot of transfer is going on. Okay? This is an unloaded control subject. This is an African woman. You can see they're really quite similar. There's a, uh, the transfer goes up and is relatively flat and high during the going up stage. And when you're vertical, when you're right at the middle of the step, the transfer goes to zero in both of them. And then when you fall forward, the, the transfer is good, but it's not, it doesn't go up and nice and flat as you expect in a more ideal situation. This is unloaded. When we look at loaded, we see this, this situation. The control subjects, the transfer looks exactly the same as before. It goes up, stays relatively high, goes down in mid stance, and then comes back up to a peak and then goes down again. But look what happens with the African women. They are relatively the same, goes up, very short peak here, it goes up again rapidly to a level which is quite good, has a peak, and so on. These women, this is the difference. I'm going to flip back and forth between these two slides. Unloaded, <coughs> loaded. You can see the vertical, uh, the, the control subjects here don't really change. But if you look at the African women, we're going to look at this part of the curve here, is unloaded versus loaded. So that is where the African women make a difference. When they're carrying a load from the time when they're in the high, vertically oriented, their, their foot is directly under the center of mass, they're able to accelerate forward faster than we are and get a better exchange of energy. You can see, particularly clearly here, the fall of potential energy is much more rapid than the increase in kinetic energy there. And that's what's limiting the transfer. And in these women carrying the load, the fall in potential energy is mirrored nicely by a rapid increase in the kinetic energy. So that's, in fact, what the African women do. It's different than us. And this is a, an ideal situation. This is a, just one step, an example. But in this, this step, you can see the symmetry between the the kinetic or the mirror image, I want to say, between the kinetic energy and the potential energy is really quite nice here. And as a result, the, the transfer goes up to a nice high percentage and more or less stays there. And there is no zero, in fact. There, in the middle, at the top, there is no lack of transfer. They, they become really good pendulums. And this is an example of how the African women are able to carry these loads cheaply. It explains how the African women are able to carry these loads cheaply, and in particular, how they can carry a 20% load for free, for no metabolic cost at all. Okay, so this is uh, just a, sh a short uh, exposition, but uh, I hope you understood. Uh, African women in general, they can carry 20% of their body weight for free. They can carry big loads uh, for long distances. They routinely do this. They can carry a large load, say over 60% of their body weight, for only 60% of the cost of an army recruit. Um, and they do this by becoming better pendulums.